shot five, two stolen cars, one a police cruiser, a multi-county chase, and it all ends in a deadly crash. Stimulus checks are still missing for a lot of people in central Indiana. I'm Kara Kenny with what the IRS is telling us now. Open for business tonight. We take you inside a Zionsville boutique showing you the extra steps employees are now taking to keep you safe. This is RTV6 News at 5, working for you. Now at 5, a chilly and at times rainy Tuesday, a far cry from that weekend warmth we enjoyed. Good evening to you. I'm Mark Mullins, continuing to social distance from my home. And I'm Amanda Starantino. As rain chances diminish, the focus now turns to the thermometer. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory at his home. Kevin. And it will be busy watching the thermometer. We were at 82 on Saturday. What you alluded to were the weekend warmth now. 49 degrees and it feels cooler than that with a northeast wind at 15 lots of cloud cover we've had rain under quarter of an inch in most places from peru over toward huntington marion hartford city and muncie some very light showers those are moving northeast temperatures are coolest to the north only 43 in peru 49 in Bloomington, one degree warmer in Terre Haute. As we go through the evening between 7 and 11, the best chance for light showers will be over the northern half of the state. Temperatures clear as we go through the overnight and we wake up to temperatures in the 30s. That's where we start your Wednesday. We'll talk about where we finish and look beyond coming up in just a little bit. Kevin, thank you. Tonight, new details are still coming in regarding a police chase involving two stolen cars, including a police cruiser that started in Hamilton County. That chase spanned about 50 miles and ended with a deadly, violent crash in Montgomery County. Noblesville police say an off-duty officer was flagged down to help an argument between a man and a woman when that man took off in the officer's marked car near 100. 41st Street and State Road 37. Police say that same suspect eventually ditched the police cruiser and stole someone else's car and led officers on a chase. Eventually, the suspect crashed near I-74 and State Road 32. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Department said that he sideswiped a vehicle, hit the back of a semi, and was killed. His identity has not been released at this time. And now to the day's developments in the state's fight against COVID-19 after two days of deaths in the teens, the number jumped quite a bit today. The 62 deaths reported today occurred between March 31st and yesterday. The state total is 1,213. There are 541 new positive cases for a total of just over 21,000. Nearly 116,000 Hoosiers have been tested. And the state continues to provide details about the ages of those who have died. There are very few deaths in people birth through 49. Now about 75% of the deaths are in people age 70 and older. Globally, the number of positive cases has topped 3.6 million with more than 254,000 deaths. More than 70,000 of those are in the U.S., but the number of Americans who have recovered continues to grow, now more than 187,000. And by this time tomorrow, there will be 20 more places you can get tested for COVID-19. The Indiana State Department of Health is opening 20 sites across the state for free COVID-19 testing. The tests will be available for anyone symptomatic for the virus or if you came in close contact with someone who's positive for COVID-19. Registration is open now at lhi.care slash COVID testing. The sites will be open Monday through Friday going forward. The state is planning to open 30 more sites next week. I want to thank Hoosiers for all you're doing to keep our friends, family, and neighbors safe. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So we need you to continue to be vigilant as we start to reopen things. You can view a full map of sites where you can get tested on the IndyChannel.com. The Rebound Indiana is our commitment to helping Hoosiers get back on their feet. Each day, Call 6 Investigates has been digging for answers for people still waiting on their stimulus checks. Our Kara Kenny spoke with an Indianapolis woman on Social Security who has been hit with a double whammy. The federal government started sending out stimulus checks in mid-April. Fast forward three weeks and many Hoosiers are still waiting and some are afraid they'll never see their money. It's very frustrating. I check the status of stimulus first and I get the same answer as I get when I check the status for my actual refund. It says there's nothing there. Doretta New lives in Indianapolis and is on Social Security. 
leave. She filed her taxes via mail on March 11th. Doretta still has not received her federal refund or her stimulus check. She wants to know where her money is and if it will show up in her Social Security benefits. Well, right now it's kind of real important. Um, not necessarily for me, but I'm having to help out one of my children because they've lost their jobs. So, you know, I'm planning on using that money to help them until they can get back on their feet because they also have not gotten any stimulus checks. We reached out to Social Security who told us it's the Treasury, not Social Security, that's making direct payments to eligible people. The IRS told us taxpayers do not need to take additional action if they've already filed their tax return. There could be a delay if the IRS hasn't finished processing your return or if they don't have your bank account information. Doretta sent another copy of her tax return to the IRS this week and hopes to get her refund and stimulus check very soon. Part of the reason frustration is mounting, the IRS isn't answering the phone. When we tried today, we were told they're unable to provide live assistance. Reporting in Indianapolis, Kara Kenny, RTV6. Security recipients were supposed to take action by last month to get a stimulus check. There are certain conditions and restrictions. We've laid those out for you on our website, theindychannel.com slash rebound. And right now we need to get to an ABC News special report for a new one-on-one -on -one interview with anchor David Muir and President Trump. In the reopening, the regions that he believes are ready to do this, but he knows that even as he signals with his own trip that the country can do this, that it comes amid a raging debate over whether or not this is happening too quickly and whether or not lives are actually being put at risk. Some of these states still have not reached their plateau, and I did ask the president whether or not these states have all met the guidelines that the president himself put out there. And one of the things I talked to the president about were the comments from Dr. Anthony Fauci in the last 24 hours, his very cautious words about moving forward too quickly in reopening the country. Here's the exchange just moments ago. I want to ask you about what Dr. Fauci said last night about the reopening of the country. He said it's the balance of something that's a very difficult choice. How many deaths and how much suffering are you willing to accept to get back where you want to be? Do you see it that way? Do you believe that's the reality we're facing, that, that lives will be lost to reopen the country? It's possible there will be some because you won't be locked into an apartment or a, or a house or whatever it is. But at the same time, we're going to practice social distancing. We're going to be washing hands. We're going to be doing a lot of the things that we've learned to do over the last period of time. And we have to get our country back. You know, people are dying the other way, too. When you look at what's happened with drugs, it goes up. When you look at suicides, I mean, take a look at what's going on. People are losing their jobs. We have to bring it back, and that's what we're doing. The president just moments ago on his efforts to try to start reopening this country, and it comes amid real debate. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York just today saying this comes down uh, to human life and how valuable that life is in these states deciding when and how to reopen. I do want to get to our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl, because, John, that was striking uh, an acknowledgement from the president mm -hmm. that there could be lives here at risk. And the president has said, David, that this decision on whether or not to reopen and how to reopen uh, is the most would be the most difficult decision of his presidency. But at the same time, he has largely turned that decision over to the governors, made it clear that the governors will ultimately be the ones to make decisions about whether or not and how to reopen uh, their states. The president himself seems eager to move beyond this moment in an extraordinary development today, David. Uh, we have learned the vice president has confirmed confirmed uh, that the White House plans to disband the coronavirus task force, the White House task force on this issue by the end of this month. An extraordinary development considering that we are just now uh, seeing peak levels of infection and of deaths. And of course, John, this comes amid those two new studies. One is a preliminary analysis from Johns Hopkins, the other from the University of Washington, and both cautioned against a quick reopening of this country, saying it could cost lives, it could double the daily death toll uh, by June, said one study. Another uh, said we could be looking at 135,000 deaths, American lives, uh, by August. I did present the president with the findings of those studies. Uh, he didn't discount those numbers, but he did acknowledge that his own um, estimate of 
the death toll has grown in recent weeks. Uh, the president had been saying 60,000 lives could be lost. Now he is acknowledging that up to 100,000 American lives could be lost. I want to bring in our chief medical editor, Dr. Jen Ashton, with us late today as well. And Jen, the president also making news on the vaccine. There's been so much talk about Operation Warp Speed, his, his push to have 300 million doses of a vaccine in place by the first of the year. I asked him uh, whether or not he could promise that. He backed off of that, saying he's not sure if it could be possible, uh, seeming to acknowledge the very uh, delicate uh, task it is in not only coming up with a vaccine, but really taking a gamble this far out on, on which vaccine to invest so heavily in. Well, David, I think that's appropriate. We have to remember in our toolbox against COVID-19, we have prevention and we have treatment. And when you talk about a vaccine for prevention, past history tells us that it normally takes decades to try to develop a vaccine. Remember, it has to be not only safe, but it has to be effective. And then it has to be scaled up to the tune of hundreds of millions of doses. That has never been done before. So while we have the whole world working on this, uh, you know, those caveats, that type of very cautious optimism slash skepticism is absolutely medically and scientifically appropriate. Dr. Jen Ashton with us here late today as well. Again, President Trump making his first trip out into the country in two months, uh, choosing to come to the battleground state of Arizona. I asked him a number of questions about the possibility of 19% unemployment, which would mean uh, nearly one in five Americans could be out of work. Those numbers expected later this week. I asked him about uh, his handling of the pandemic, he said, I should get credit, though I don't, is what he said. And I asked him about the election now six months away as we stand here in the battleground state of Arizona. I said, is he comfortable with the idea that this election could be a referendum on his handling of the pandemic? He said, I am, but I'm not. It was a complicated answer and we'll have much more on what the president said about the pandemic in this country and about his plan to push forward with reopening parts of this country. I'm David Muir here in Phoenix. We'll have continuing coverage at ABC news.com on your local news for many of you which is coming up next and i'll see you right here for world news tonight good day and that was a portion of david muir's one-on-one -on -one interview with president trump watch the rest tonight at 6 30 on world news tonight we'll be right back to keller keller and keller Today is Giving Tuesday, and the United Way of Central Indiana is asking you to consider making a donation to its Basic Needs Fund. For many of our neighbors who have lost their job due to the pandemic, there is a real panic about paying bills and providing for the family. The Basic Needs Fund provides grants to partner organizations to help individuals and families in need. So to donate, just go to basicneedsin.com. Local animal shelters have had to make some adjustments during the pandemic. Leaders with Indianapolis Animal Care Services tell us they have been operating under appointment only and trying to slow down their intake. They are also working to keep space free for animals that may have to come in because their owner is hospitalized. They say they've seen a lot of support from the community during this time and a record number of foster families. We've gained over 125 new foster homes. Um, to get animals out and at this time we are now housing more animals in foster homes than we are actually at the shelter. It's really rewarding helping these animals uh, get to their forever homes, uh, helping them from a rough situation. Uh, they usually come to us sicker, uh, stressed out from being in a kennel and we get them in a better environment for them to heal and become the best versions of themselves. And we are approaching kitten season, so the need for fosters will continue to grow. IACS is also asking for donations to help with their programs and support services. And the original farmer's market at City Market is ready to open tomorrow, but with new rules and safety precautions in place, the market will be open every Wednesday through October from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. There will be a few changes in the coronavirus era, though. No prepared food will be available, no home-based vendors, no demos or sampling. All foods sold on-site will be pre-packaged in a licensed facility and labeled according to federal guidelines. No food is to be eaten on-site, and live entertainment will be temporarily suspended. There will be signage to help keep you six feet away from the next person and you are encouraged to bring your own masks and gloves.
Now to your Storm Team 6 forecast here on this Tuesday evening. And Kevin, I got to say, it's kind of nice to actually be home today with the temperatures we're seeing. Uh, not too many people out and about. I think what happens, this sets up tomorrow and Thursday that will feel so much warmer, but still remain cool, if you follow me. Let's go to Eagle Creek. I think you'd only be surprised if the boats were actually out on the water. If someone was sailing or out there fishing, a lot of boats just docked with that wind today and temperatures hovering around 50 and the occasional showers. Uh, kind of a tough day on the water. Let's show you the trend. Obviously today, very un -may like if I can say it that way. Then we jump tomorrow to 58. We'll be back in a respectable temperature range of 65 on Thursday, only to slide again as we go Friday into Mother's Day weekend. That's how temperatures will bounce around. Other than the showers ongoing now in the northern half of the state, next best chance for rain arrives on Friday. There's your rain from Peru to the east to just about Fort Wayne. There are other showers back in Illinois that will move from west to east and keep that chance for rain, especially over the northern half of the state between now and 11. 42 in Tipton, temperature in Bedford, 7 degrees warmer, 50 degree temperatures in Terre Haute and Sullivan. That is just a shocking change from our Saturday high of 82 degrees. And as far as temperatures into the weekend, we stay very cool. Everything's upside down, even Buddy. Mark Janowski sending this picture today. Buddy just having a good time inside the day. Temperatures in the 40s through the evening hours with a couple of rain showers. Hopefully you didn't turn your TV upside down to get a better look at Buddy. Everything needs to be right side up now. 7 a.m. tomorrow, skies will be clearing through the day, picking up more sunshine as we go along. We'll start cool. Temperatures will be in the 30s, upper 30s, but recover to 42 at 8 a.m. 53 at noon, temperature in the afternoon with more sunshine at 58 degrees. Temperatures tomorrow, uh, about 60 degrees, Terre Haute to Columbus South. The warmest day in my forecast, that's Thursday. The best part of these temperatures, they come with sunshine. That'll be nice, combination of relatively mild temperatures and some sunshine. Show you what happens overnight Thursday into Friday. Clouds increase and our rain chances will as well. Forecast model showing perhaps some snow mixing in once you get north of Peru toward Fort Wayne from Marion toward Fort Wayne on I-69 first thing on Friday morning. There's the big headline for Saturday morning. Freezing temperatures likely. Most areas will be in that 30 to about 33 degree temperature range as we step into Mother's Day weekend. As I mentioned, the warming trend through Thursday, then it's cooler, as you can see, right through the weekend. Mother's Day, a chance for showers in the afternoon hours and a 58 degree high temperature. All right, Kevin, well, guess what? It is Takeout Tuesday. And if you're down in the Bloomington area or just want to take a drive, Malibu Grill is open for takeout. Now, Malibu Grill is located on the east side of the square on Walnut Street in Bloomington. It's been a destination for locals, IU grads, post and pregame meals, and more for nearly two decades. There they have a gallery of photos going back 20 years of happy customers there. They're open for carryout Tuesday through Saturday from 4 to 9 p.m. Steaks, fresh seafood food, salads, and sandwiches are all on the menu there. It's not only Takeout Tuesday, but it's also Cinco de Mayo, May 5th here. And one Indianapolis restaurant did not let COVID-19 spoil the celebration. La Margarita in Fountain Square has been closed since March 16th when the stay-at-home order took effect. Well, it opened for today only for customers to pick up their email orders of food and drink, including some margarita making supplies, tortilla chips, and sauces. They saw many familiar faces as they delivered curbside. It's good to hear from a lot of our regular customers. You know, we've we've been blessed to have uh, quite a few uh, regulars uh, over the course of the 34 years we've been open. So just to kind of hear from all, all of them and just see they're doing well still, even though, you know, they're pretty much at home. It's been uh, it's nice to reconnect in that sense and provide, you know, <laughs> some food and drinks. La Margarita sold out of everything. They're not sure when they'll be able to reopen. They say the safety of their customers is the most important to them right now. Happy Cinco. Well, since you can't take a trip to the zoo right now, the staff is bringing the zoo to you. Tonight, we have some fun facts about giraffes that could help you win a trivia contest someday. Apply online today. 
It's going to be a while before the Indianapolis Zoo can reopen under the governor's plan, at least until mid-June. In the meantime, the staff continues to work together to bring the zoo to you. It's a virtual visit on the zoo's Facebook page. They post daily videos and chats with staff to help you learn more about the zoo's residents. Um, if someone comes in with like a really bright uh, shirt or pants on, sometimes that'll make them standoffish a bit. They are one of the few animals that have full spectrum of the rainbow, so they can see all colors. Each neck is typically five to six feet, depending on the individual. Um, Height-wise, our uh, male Majani there is about 17 feet tall. Our females, uh, primarily AJ here, is about 14 feet. So there is a size difference between the sexes. And you can check out this video and meet more zoo friends on the Indianapolis Zoo's Facebook page. We'll be back with the news at 6. And we will see you then.